Rave parties, a concept originally founded in the UK, known for their muddy fields, drugs and of course, loud bass music. But what really happens and goes into such big parties that sometimes only last a few hours? What makes these events so different, making them grow in popularity within the last few years? That's why I'm heading over to Brittany in France to find out a bit more about these types of events. You might be wondering why I'm going to France if the movement started in the UK. Well, after the first events in the UK in the 80s, the movement quickly spread across the channel where the French put their own twist on things. Be it with the music, audience or even the frequency of the events, the French changed the raving game. But before we actually make our way to a rave, let me teach you a bit more about where they come from. As I previously mentioned, rave parties originated from the UK, but the music that started it all comes from America, Chicago to be more specific. Back in the mid 80s was where a new type of genre was born. It was called Acid House and it was a subgenre of house music. The first record of the genre was produced by the group Future, a group of DJs from Chicago. From this new type of music emerged Acid House parties in the Chicago area in the mid to late 1980s. After Acid House artists started to gain overseas success, this new type of music quickly spread to the UK, within clubs and warehouses, first in Manchester and then in London. By 1987, the house music scene was in full swing, but when the rave culture started taking over the world, the UK youth had to fight for their right to party. Section 63 of the 1994 Criminal Justice Act was the law that made raving impossible. The law forbid gatherings and the police were raiding the suburbs and outskirts of the cities, stopping any activities they considered to be suspicious. This led the movement to go underground. Which brings me onto the topic that I'm mainly focusing on, free parties. The term free party actually comes from the first sound systems that wanted to fight the oppression by travelling around the world and holding these types of events, the spiral tribes being the biggest influence on the movement. These are the types of parties that we usually find in France, hence why I'm heading over there. One of the biggest and most important sound systems in the French raving culture are the heretics. They threw the most known free party in France in Paris in the year 2001. It was held in an abandoned public swimming pool known as the Molitor. Many news articles and documentaries were made on this event as it is the tipping point for the French raving culture. Let's fast forward to the present day. The movement has spurred in popularity in the last four years with the internet that has revolutionized the access to the events. The amount of people attending the events has raised immensely giving us a wide range of ages compared to before. As the years go on, the same fights against the authorities continue, and the risk of throwing these parties is getting more severe. Organisers can be risking up to months in prison for the gatherings. However, with the movement growing, there have been organisations that have built up in the last few years, under the names of Bass Expression and Freeform. Their aim is to open a way of dialogue, work on the communication with the government, and rationalise the consequences of holding these events. Now that you have a bit more knowledge on what rave parties are and where they come from, let's actually go and experience one first hand. So now we're just waiting for the car to arrive for us to then get in and then phone up the info line to know exactly where we're going for this rave party. Um, the way it works is that you get this number that's a universal number for every rave party and you get a code and with that code you put it into the phone and then that's where you get all the information for that rave party in particular. After waiting around for a few hours with my friend, our colleagues finally met us on the parking. We waited in the car for the info line to come out. The wait can often be very long. When it finally came out, we decided to give it a call, but we couldn't seem to get through. After multiple attempts, we decided to give up. We had to then call some other colleagues to get information on the location of a different rave. This one was done by text message, which I didn't manage to get my hands on. Nonetheless, we typed in the location into Google Maps and went on our way. Info lines are the main way of finding the location of the event. Essentially, what an info line is, is a free messaging box that has a universal number. The hosts of the event create a code to get into the box. You can only get the code through flyers, sometimes given out at other events, or a general text message sent out a few weeks before the rave that you can receive via peers. After driving for a good two hours, we knew we were starting to get close when we saw a police car with its sirens on next to a van covered in graffiti. We decided to drive a bit further and eventually found the site. As we looked for the entrance onto the site, two young men Do came to greet us and asked for our donation. This is basically your ticket in, but it's at an unset price. After we had passed the first stage, we went to find somewhere to park. Once we had parked, my colleagues and I got ready to go inside to see the party. 
The first steps were impressive as we walked into an abandoned factory. There were food stands just after the entrance, and with a slight turn to the right, there was a huge crowd in front of a wall of speakers, diffusing extremely loud music with a light game throwing lines of light to the back of the room. As mesmerizing as this was, there were a lot of young people coming up to me and my colleagues asking if we wanted to buy drugs that put into reality the dangers that can be found in places and how it can influence people into bad decisions. We spent a lot of time standing around the crowded area throughout the night. We also got to see some of the public play with fire. Unfortunately, I couldn't get to talk to any of them since I lost them from my sight. We met some new people who turned out to be very nice and from the same areas we were based. I thought that this was a great opportunity to ask a few questions, so I asked one of the people from the group to do an interview in the morning, which she kindly accepted to do. Du coup, euh, ça fait combien de temps que tu vas en free party Depuis mes 18 ans, j'en ai aujourd'hui 21 ans, donc euh, 3 4 ans. D'accord, et tu connais un peu l'histoire de la teuf, hein, d'où ça vient de Chicago. Yes, 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 yes. Et ça t'intéresse Tu viens ici euh, pour quelle raison en fait Pour m'amuser, pour euh, me vider la tête euh, de mes problèmes. Mm -hmm. Et euh, bah, euh, apéro, copains, le son. C'est euh, ça, ouais, ouais, ouais. ouais. Et puis, euh, tu recommanderais ça à tout le monde ou tu, tu penses que c'est juste non, pour quelques personnes mais... non, Parce que bah, un problème dans la teuf, euh, bah, c'est bien la drogue et les gens un peu en sable, euh, je les mettrai pas là-dedans. Maintenant, euh, j'emmènerai des gens avec moi, mais j'en apprendrai avant tout ce que c'est, puis d'aimer le son avant, avant tout. Voilà. Yes. As morning rose, I decided to go out for a walk. The surrounding area wasn't the prettiest, especially since it was raining. This gave me the idea to go and speak to the people holding the stands. The first stand that I asked said yes, but then got bombarded with customers. So I decided to go next door, who luckily wasn't too busy. Watching this footage back, I realized we didn't choose the best area to film, but I got a lot of information nonetheless and enjoyed the nice chat with them. It was really interesting to hear about holding stands at these events. After that interview, I decided that I was tiring, so I headed back to the car to rest up for a bit. After resting for an hour or so, I headed back into the factory, to the sound of no music. We all knew what was happening as the police were talking to the organizers on the entrance. People came together to help take down the wall of speakers, and my friend and I decided to explore the abandoned factory. It was beautiful to see the places that can be found for these events, and the time it must take to imagine a plan of the night. This is where my second camera battery died, so I did miss out on a good part of the morning. So after a lot of travelling, I'm finally back home in the UK, back in my room, and I've been able to process a bit more about what I learnt while on this experience. Now, I just want to touch on the point that I would be lying if I was to say that I had never attended this sort of event, or even if I was to say that I didn't consider myself part of the movement. But nonetheless, I went into this experience being non-biased, so I could use this documentary to 
teach you, the audience, more about what rave parties are and where they come from, instead of trying to push the opinion that they're this amazing place that everyone should love. From this idea, I didn't go out to a rave in the aim of trying to find loads of people to interview, asking them about their really in-depth opinions about raving culture, apart from Doreen, who was extremely kind to let me interview her in the morning. However, I didn't want to leave this documentary without having a bit of an overall opinion of what raving culture is today. So for this, I prepared a survey that I shared on my Facebook that I knew would hit the right target audience for the kind of people that I have on that social media, and I got a good amount of replies with some very good written out opinions. There are a mix of positives and negatives when it came to my conclusion, but in some way I guess that was what I was expecting. I'm gonna keep it short and touch on three points. One being that I feel like there's a dispute in between the raving community, in between people who believe that the raving culture has become too open to every kind of person and every kind of age, and then there's another side of the culture that believes that it should be open to everyone because it is classified as an open event, meaning that anyone and everyone should be able to attend. The second point is the illicit substances that are found in these areas. This is basically mixing in with the first point where people have mentioned the fact that it's too open for every kind of age and person and with the fact that there are these substances that can't always be tested, people do believe that it can be at high danger for a lot of people, but the people on the other side of the spectrum who believe that it's the right thing that these events are open for everyone tend to believe that self-control, self-respect and being able to say no are the right ways of going to these parties. The third point is that even with these disputes going on, you can see that the main thing that people go looking for when they attend these parties is freedom and to get away from their everyday life. To wrap an end to this documentary, I just hope that I've been able to teach you a bit more about what rave parties are and where they come from, and maybe one day they'll stop being known for their muddy fields, drugs, and of course, loud bass music.